Good morning. Uh, the last speaker was, uh, was terrific, and I'll get over it eventually. Um, last fall, uh, we had a meeting of our Momentum Group. And since everybody in our Momentum Group is now significantly north of the age of 60, we decided that we would begin to explore opportunities that are available to us for activities and, and uh, ideas that we can focus on which will energize us and, and uh, bring us new opportunities as we go forward to the next phase of our lives and as some of us uh, begin to wind down to a certain degree in our business lives. One of the textbooks that we read was one that you were received in your, in your book order, and that is called The Third Chapter by Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. And I strongly recommend that you take the time to read that book. It's a very fast read. But basically what she's talking about, and she gives a number of examples, is take the time to really reflect on your life and, and the things that are important to you and begin to think creatively on how you might use the next 20 or 30 years or more. Certainly, Joe shared with us yesterday things that we can do to enable us to be able to enjoy those years in relatively good health, but we still need to figure out what each of our own individual paths might be. This morning, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to share with you the experience of Dr. Albert Hurwitz. And Albie, as I think I, I said the other day, Chrissy and I met Albie a number of years ago, 35 years ago, uh, when our youngest son, who was then six months old, needed to undergo some fairly significant tests. And Dr. Hurwitz not only was exceptionally professional, but he was exceptionally caring. And when you have a six-month-old child going through tests, it is obviously a difficult and challenging time for the parents. And Albie took very, care, very good care of all three of us. And then after reading uh, uh, Sarah uh, Lightfoot's book, we had an opportunity one evening to listen to Albie as he talked about the decision that he made in his life at the peak of his medical career. To listen to a voice that was speaking to him about the possibility, highly unlikely, but the possibility of writing a symphony. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you today this remarkable man and allow you to have the opportunity to listen to the work that he produced. Albie Herwin. Just going to make a little room here. Well, first, a huge thank you to Ezra and those kind words. I also have a big thank you to Karen Hamilton and others on the staff of M Financial. Uh, when Ezra said that I spoke at his home, it was an intimate group of 12, 14 people, not like you guys. And this is the first time, frankly, that uh, I've ever made any, uh, this kind of ambitious speech. And that staff was wonderful. They held my hand, were not condescending, and I thank you all very much. I first want to play a short segment of music 
45 seconds. Many in the world of class, classical music feel that music, music should stand on its own without the listener having to know anything about the background of the music. And I agree with that. It should have that integrity to stand alone. On the other hand, I think when one knows the background of the music, it can, be, it can result in a much more compelling experience. You be the judge of that because I am now going to play this 45 second se segment and at the end of my talk, uh, you will hear it again and see if you feel any differently about it. begin the talking part and halfway through we'll start up with some music again. Family history because that's all entwined with this endeavor. In 1735, we have records of this, a man named Kalman was born in Prague. Kalman is my middle name and he was my great 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 grandfather. 1780, the family being persecuted, Jewish family being persecuted as part of the diaspora where hundreds of thousands of people being persecuted kept moving eastward across Europe to try and find safety. They began the trek and landed in a small farming village called Milkowitz in White Russia. By the way, Milkowitz is my mother's maiden name and obviously the family got the name from the town and not vice versa. Kalman had a son by the name of Yeshia. There he is. And now he was born in uh, 1796. It's rare that you will see somebody born of that age. And one of the contributing factors was he lived to be 106. Yeshia had a son named Zelig. And there is Zelig with his wife, Goldie. And Zelig and Goldie had a son named Isaac, my grandfather. And here he is with his wife and six children. And the one, the little girl right in the middle is my mother, Helen. The family flourished, as you will see. And by the way, notice up on the wall there, there's that picture that you saw of Goldie. They brought it to the United States. And there they are, and on uh, bottom row, second from the le left, legs crossed. Yes, that's me. In the, the, for about 100 years, the family lived in the town of Milkowitz. But towards the late 1800s, again, persecution, and uh, it was, oh, there were terrible years for the family. And at some point, the elders, could we have the, that's it, the elders, those three said to this group, plus eight other children, six of which obeyed what they said, they must leave, they must separate, and by the way, when they did, they knew they were never going to see each other again. And they separated and came to the United States. Uh, 
My biography is really pretty unremarkable for most of the time, uh, perhaps for all the time. But in any case, I was born in Hartford in 1931. Typical childhood, at the age of seven or eight, three years of piano lessons, I would say I was a fair student, and after three years, quit. Next musical exposure. On occasion, I would go to my father's hardware store and he'd pay me a few dollars to sweep the floors and move the inventory, and once in a while, allow me the great pleasure of making a sale on the floor. One day I went there, and on the shelves were a series of classical records. I asked him if I could not take one of these home in lieu of payment, he agreed. It was a Beethoven symphony. Some of you, perhaps all of you, will know what I mean by a 78 RPM record. And to play a Beethoven symphony, there were perhaps four or five or six of these records in an album. And I would sit with my phonograph and play record one, side A, flip it to side B, and that's how, that's how music was heard for many decades. And, and the several times I went back after that, I was paid with record albums, and I ended up with probably four Beethoven symphonies and a couple of Tchaikovsky symphonies, and a few of them are still in my attic. I listened to those. I really listened, and I would say for a year or so, I was seriously into it. But probably at the age of 12, 13, girls came into the picture, games came into this picture, sporting activities, uh, and so I had set the records aside. One of the sporting activities uh, I was playing in, I had my nose injured very severely. At that time, the football helmets didn't have the face guards on, and so the, you'll see people of my generations with all kind of bends in their noses, but mine was more than just a bend. And uh, the surgeon operated, and on discharging me from the hospital, said, for a period of Three weeks, at least, I had to rest quietly, or else it would bleed. I did, and at that location at that time was an old erect piano, uh, upright piano, semi-erect, I guess, but it was an uh, upright piano. And one day I walked over and hit a key, and another key, and realized I could play Mary Had a Little Lamb, or Yankee Doodle Dandy. And then, after a day or two of that, I tried applying a chord, and of course had the wrong chord. And by trial and error, I didn't know what the chord was, but by trial and error, I could hear, that's right, that chord supports this note. And after playing for several notes longer, I would hear a shift in chord. I wouldn't know what it was, trial and error, another chord. After a week or two more, I had a little umpa rhythm in my right hand, and the chords became more complex, and perhaps a little harmonies in the right hand. And before long, I was playing popular songs, Irving Berlin kind of songs, always in the key of C. And I still play 99% of time in the key of C, and my symphony, that's how it started, the key of C. It shifts keys. I'm not aware of it necessarily, but I'm using strange chords, but Key of C is where I am comfortable. At that time, I started to compose a little as well. And most of the work was very amateurish, I'm sure, and I've forgotten most of the pieces I composed. Although I did have a, and I've always had, a new number system. Rather than notes on a staff, I would designate C with a number and up and down from there, or for shortcuts, just a graph. And if the note was longer, horizontally, it would be longer on this level. And if there's a short note lower, it's like that. Uh, now, one of the songs uh, I really liked, and I've played it through the years, and as I've gotten married and had children and grandchildren, they all like it. But it's been a pretty localized kind of uh, listening. When I was composing the fourth movement of the symphony, as you will hear, the, the first three movements take place in Europe. 
Then the family comes over, and the fourth movement is, it's called Arrival, it's to America. Part of the reason I compose this, I would like to believe, is to leave a little bit of a legacy, at least for my family. The way people pass down photographs, I thought, boy, this would be nice if my grandchildren, great-grandchildren, not only pictorially saw their family history, but perhaps heard a little of it. And in my mind, the fourth movement um, had a goal besides just music, and that was the message that we can't forget the past, that it has to be part of us to help us progress in the future, progress safely in the future. In the middle of the third movement, uh, where I'm bringing back some of these themes, I needed a new theme to swoop up the older themes. And for a period of two or three weeks, nothing. It's fun trying, but nothing came up. And one day I just doodled this little tune, and it is now the main theme of the last half of the symphony. It's been percolating there for 50 years, waiting to take its place. Well, the usual high school years, college, medical school, a lot of postgraduate training. Uh, my, when I was chief resident, this was all in Boston, when I was chief resident, I was offered an NIH fellowship for which I agreed and wanted to do research, which I did. Uh, and it came out pretty well. It was published as a lead article in the New England Journal of Medicine. But as I was completing all these postgraduate studies, decision, and Ezra has rightfully said, we all, not only older people or people graduating from high school, but, and sometimes unpleasant decisions and sometimes elective decisions, but there is that infrequent life-altering decision. Well, here I was. I saw the amount of work I had put in, besides my chief resident responsibilities was this research. Uh, and for the first time in my life, I made a decision considering other people. My wife, Joan, we've been married for 57 years, and at that point, we had three young children. I knew if I stayed in the academic area, I was beginning to learn a little something about myself, We've seen type A personalities. I scored 2017 on that. <laughs> and I knew something, a little something about myself and know, knew that I would want to climb the ladder. But that would mean deprivation in my family, me with them, them with me. And I did make the decision at that time to go into private practice. In doing so, there was, in addition to my family, and I think it was, a good it was a good decision, because in addition to the benefits for the family, professionally, there were very good, there, was very, there were very good results as well. Because being my practice, I had the autonomy to apply whatever skills I had in the manner I, which I wanted to. And part of that, Ezra alluded to, uh, the experience of most people, probably with many of you, in going to a radiology office, a lot of funny equipment, making a lot of noises, people scurrying around. And at the end, it's not frequent you see the radiologist. You say, may see the technologist, oh yes, your doctor will get the results in three or four days. I went into medicine partly because I like people. And as a typical radiologist, you very often don't have much to do with people unless you're injecting them. Well, I set up this practice where it was a personal practice, where I would see every patient, and when I thought necessary, examine a patient, and give the patient the results before they left the office. And to me, this was a thrilling kind of practice to participate in. But let's talk about decision making. Ezra has indicated that some of you, 
now or in the future, certainly in the near future, may be making a life-altering decision. Retirement, but other things may come up as well. Now, your business people out there, and most of the decisions you make, you know the factors. There may be uh, one that slips in later on that you didn't think about, but in general, you know the factors, and you can quantify the factors. Life-altering decisions are different. There are many factors that are there that you don't discover until later on, and even those factors you have are very hard to quantify. I've, on one, more than one occasion, elected to undergo the process of a life-altering decision. And in doing so, one thing that I've stuck by is my thought that one of the greatest risks in life is not taking a significant risk. When the day comes, I hope many years from now, and it's my time to look back as life comes towards its end, and I look back, I don't think I'm going to have much resentment or disappointment with the risks that I took that failed or the errors that I've made. I've made my share of errors, that's for sure. But what might be haunting is the path that I didn't take, the door you didn't open, the corner that you didn't walk around. That can be a very haunting thought. Gee, what if I had? Because it's possible that by doing so, there'd be a new great area of success. But I purposely will change that word because what really counts is fulfillment. Success may or may not be part of it. That there'd be a glorious area of fulfillment. And then you start weighing the risk-reward ratios. Langston Hughes, the poet, said it far better than I can. A dream deferred risks becoming a raisin withering in the sun. And Stephen Jobs, in his now very famous and extremely well uh, distributed graduation speech, and I think it was 2005, went into this topic very thoroughly. And by the way, uh, I noticed that the group, and I think it's a wonderful name you gave to this, my little talk here, Fulfilling Your Passion, that's exactly what his article is on, Fulfilling One's Passion. I'm not so sure he didn't go a little too far in his opinion. I'm very humble, he's one of the geniuses of all geniuses. But when he says, don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice, and most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become, everything else is secondary. Also in this long, uh, speech he gave, he says, you have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. This approach has never let me down and has made all the difference in the world, and he concludes by saying, stay foolish, stay hungry. Well, that's fine for Stephen Jobs, because, you know, he's one in a billion, we're not. To tell impressionable impressionable graduating students or people of any age, only listen to yourself. And what he says, by the way, in pursuing your dream, your karma, do it for as long as it takes. Just believe in yourself. I think that most of us are biased about ourselves. I'm not sure we're the most reliable source for the total decision making. We inflate things about ourselves, we deflate things about ourselves, and to suggest that one undertake a life-altering decision and don't listen to anybody else, uh, to me, um, I don't agree with it. Humbly, don't agree with it. Um, I strongly believe, to conclude this part, that if one is going to try and leap to the stars, your feet have to be very firmly planted on the ground, and the ground has to be very firm earth. 
And to do so otherwise, in my mind, yes, there'll be one in a million who do it, and I've been very lucky, but the majority who do it solely on the basis of just believe in yourself and don't listen to anybody else, I think uh, may not have a happy result. So here I am many years later, age 55, and I have a life-altering decision. Love my practice, very fulfilling. Some parts may not be as ideal as I would have wanted, uh, and I miss it to this very day. But just at that time, uh, music was really coming out of my head, and I had a decision to make. And I followed my own advice and went to the chairman of the Department of Music at the Hart School of Music, University of Hartford, and we had a very long, in-depth conversation, and he heard some of my music. In conclusion, he said, go for it, which is what I wanted to hear, I think. And I decided to go for it. Now, ordinarily, that would mean taking piano lessons for a year, undergraduate work four years, two or three years of postgraduate work for the kind of music I was talking about. But I discussed with him a new advent in music, and that was the invention of synthesizers, of computer software programs. And, I did, and he agreed. I did, decided to go to that route. And because of that, I've never studied theory or harmony, anything about music. I think many of you technically know a lot more about music than I might. So next step. Get the equipment. I'll try. How many of you know what MIDI is or how all these funny things work? Yeah, maybe 5% or less. So I'll very briefly discuss what this is. I have a keyboard on my desk. It looks like a piano, and it looks like a lot of the synthesizers you see, but this keyboard does not produce sound. On a piano, you strike a note, and you, you hit the uh, hammer, it flips up, and it, and it strikes the strings. And you get sound. That's, that's um, analog sound. It's true sound. You hit, no, you get analog sound. Not the keyboard that's used for this purpose. You hit a note, it makes no sound, but it has a lot of sensors and wires and gobbledygook under it. And with that equipment, it knows in absolute time when you hit it. It knows how fast you hit a note. It knows how hard you hit a note. It knows how long you held it. It knows in absolute time when you released it. And then, on some occasions, it knows how you withdraw your finger. All these digital messages go through complex software programs. And I, they, I have a thousand page manual. I changed all my equipment about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, and thought, oh, big deal. I, I was able to get through it the first time, self teaching myself. So this time I can. I thought, oh, it would take two, three weeks. I'm still working on it after almost two years. 1,000-page manual, and, and what that does is direct you how to control all these variables. Shortcut this. These messages go into the computer, and on the TV monitor, I have set up a full symphonic score. You know, flutes way up, piccolos, flutes all the way down to the bass instrument. Not only that, I will convert this, instead of a piano, to a violin or an oboe, or a timpani, whatever I want. But say I, I will hit an E on a violin with a certain amount of strength, a certain way to hold it. You don't play it like a piano. And on this multiple staves there, there'll be the violin one. And it will show at this time, this note was hit. It's an E. And, how lo and then they're all kind of mathematical charts and uh, mathematical numbers where one can manipulate all of these variables. I'll play it, I'll play it back. And if I like what I hear, I may go to a cello. 
and then whatever I play on the cello is on the cello line. I'll play those two back, adding, subtracting, adding, subtracting, by ear, not by theory, just by ear, and end up with a piece of music. So from there on, I started trying to compose, um, learning how different symphonic instruments go together, which ones didn't go together, a lot of trial and error, three or four years minimum of all this composing, but mainly learning. Then did come up with a few compositions. I uh, wrote a cabaret piece of music with lyrics. It's one of the few times I've ever tried that. And I also wrote uh, what I imagined to be a, an adagio, a slow piece of music for symphony. It was about five and a half minutes long. Now, I'm driving home one day, and I hear on the radio a woman being interviewed. It's a tape recording of an interview, and she's the new executive director of the Hartford Symphony Orchestra. And she's saying, we got to get the community more involved, et cetera, et cetera. I got home, immediately called her, and said, well, here's a way to get the community involved. I understand Barbara Cook, the superb cabaret singer, is coming to perform with the symphony uh, many months from then. And is it possible she might want to sing a piece I wrote? And she said, well, unusual, but yeah, you know, if it works, it'd be great. She said, well, would you like to come down sometime? I said, are you free? She said, yes. Met her. Played the piece. It was on one of these old tape pieces. Me playing the piano, a university student singing. And she said, I really like this. I'm going to send this to Barbara Cook. I said, that's great. And while I'm here, I have this adagio. Now, when I say I have this of one of my pieces, it's the synthesized rendition. You can hear it, and in general, the instruments are fairly true. They've gotten a lot better, but it's not a live performance. And I said, I have this. Would the conductor be willing to play this? And I said, well, um, she said, well. And then she asked me all kinds of questions. Make a long story short, she said, look, he gets hundreds of these. From your background, you're an amateur. It's our job to lap off 90 so we can get to, the, or 200, whatever it is, so we can get to the bottom few. And frankly, uh, I, I cannot submit this in good conscience. I said, okay, good luck with Barbara Cook. I, 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 I don't know whether I left it there or purpose or just absentmindedly left it there. Now, you, <laughs> I type A, but I'm extremely absent-minded, and it's probably <laughs> more, more of that one. In any case, she calls a week later and says, sorry, Barbara Cook turned it down. OK. Uh, thank you very much. See you around, see you around. A week later, I get a call, a gentleman with an English accent. Hello, my name is Michael Lancaster. I'm the conductor of the Hartford Symphony. By the way, this what I'm relating is one of multiple events just by chance that, that one cannot count on. And so he said, I was walking around the office and I saw this tape. I didn't know quite what it was, so I listened to it. And I kind of like it. Could you come? I'd like to talk to you about it. I said, sure. You know, a few days later, we got together in his office. And he gave me a rather penetrating interview. And said, well, you know, that's fascinating how you did it, but no, how you did it doesn't matter. What matters is that I really like this piece of music, and uh, I'd like the Hartford Symphony to do something with it. Uh, well, I was absolutely dumbfounded. Um, you know, most composers go their whole life trying to get a piece performed by a major symphony. And I had, I'm sure, a very dumb look on my face, which is not hard to do for me. And, and, uh, and he saw this, and he said, this is what I'm telling you. Uh, the Bushnell Auditorium holds 28 people, 2,800 people, and at that point, it was usually filling pretty well. He says, on two successive nights at the Bushnell, I'm going to give a world premiere to your piece of music. And 
I was just, I couldn't speak almost. And I, Mr. Cool here said, well, thank you very much, Mr. Lancaster, that's very nice. And he said, well, I'll be in touch with you about the details. I walked out of the office, walked into the car, rolled up the windows, turned on the radio full blast, and Mr. Cool did. <laughs> And it was played. It was performed several months later. Um, it, it did get an excellent response, standing ovation, even from those who weren't my cousins. <laughs> and um, more important, he, the music critic, critic Robert Carl, and a few other professionals said, you really have to write a very much expanded piece of music. And I said, well, um, OK. I think I will. And for the next two or three years, I tried to begin a symphony. I still have those that didn't make the, the number one spot, beginning themes to start out with. And for a year, a couple of years, I worked on uh, what I hoped might be the beginning of a symphony. When I had, I asked, uh, Mr. Lancaster, and I didn't know him well. I had met him at the time he performed it and a few other times, but uh, we really weren't friends in, in, in any manner. Uh, and he was leaving the Hartford Symphony. He had uh, served a term for 15 years, though, there. And I had met him at a, a party uh, honoring him and asked him if he would come to my house and listen to the music, but with the following caveat. I needed absolute honesty. I did not want to begin a project. You know, if it were one in 10, one in 100, one in 400, maybe. If it's one in a million, no. I have a closet full of things that I'll never get through. And so he said he understood. And the analogy I used was, so that he would be totally honest, look it, I'm handy around the house. And so, and maybe a little inventive at times. And so because of that, I'm not only going to design the Taj Mahal, I'm going to build the Taj Mahal. And I fully expect you to say, don't do it. He came, he listened to the first 15 minutes. And by the way, the first three or four minutes are almost identical to, you know, you all have the CDs in your room uh, that was bound up with a book. And, the, and for you, those who are interested, listen to the first four or five minutes. It's just about identical to what I had. Many other changes were made in other parts. Uh, and so, excuse me for one second here. He listened, and then he asked to listen to two or more hours of music from my computer. And he sat back and said, I know your message to me, and I'm obeying it. I'm telling you with total honesty that you have a massive symphony in you, and you, it has to come out. And I'm so enthused, I'll work with you for the next two years to help you. The second thing he said, I still don't get, uh, he heard the first notes of the symphony, which you'll hear, ba 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 And he said, when all, all I heard when you, when you played that, was from a certain area of Europe. <clears throat> now, he knew nothing about my family history that you're going to hear about. Family history, you've heard already, common, born in Prague, et cetera. On the Hurwitz side of the family, my brother's here, and has traced the Hurwitz side back to Spain in the 1000s. Today, there's a town called Horovici, which is southwest uh, of Prague, not far from it. And anybody with the name Horowitz, Horowitz, Gerwitz, any of those derivations, probably, they probably got the name from Horowitz, Prague. But, and they were there 14, 15, 16, 1700, so, and then did move to Prague. So both sides of the family, Prague, he knew nothing of this to continue. And he said, and every time I hear that theme, you played it twice for me now, all I can think of is Prague. Why, I still don't understand. I don't know what Prague music is, but he, I, he nailed it. Uh, and I, I now call that the Prague thing. So, we um, 
started to work together. After he had said that, he left the house. And the next day, I sat down, turned on all the equipment. And I really got the heebie-jeebies. I thought, what am I doing here? I mean, it was like I was going to take an organic chemistry test, for which I had never studied, skipped most of the lectures, and the instructions were given in a foreign language. I mean, that's the feeling I had. But after, once I put my hands down and started music, it faded and never came back again for a period of this whole process, maybe two and a half years, whatever. I didn't have one dry spell, no writer's, musician's block. It just flowed. There were frustrations, especially with some of the equipment sometimes, uh, but it was just one great thrilling experience. And his role, Michael Lancaster's role, was first as a didactic teacher because I didn't know anything about a symphony. I, I guess it had four movements. That was about my knowledge. And we started. And he would come to the house, oh, once or twice a month. We, and at first, with uh, CDs of Mozart and Beethoven, and we'd listen, and he'd show me how they did it and the structure. So he was just a very didactic teacher. Now, talking about the structure, I, I listened, and I kind of understood, but it was somewhat foreign to me. Another serendipity here. Just about that time, I was heading up a family reunion of this family, and uh, everyone derived from, uh, from Zellick and Goldie, and there were probably 150 to 200 people there. And part of my responsibility was to give a talk on the family history, so I started to read the family history. And there I saw magic, the structure of a symphony. The first movement, as you'll see if you open up, and by the way, when you open up, pull out the insert, because a lot of these pictures and some of what I'm saying is there. Anyway, <clears throat> so what's the first movement? Origins. Prague, cross Europe to Milkowitz, Russia. Second movement, separation. Where? They're torn apart. Separation. I'll discuss that later. Third movement, I call remembrance. The name of the symphony is Remembrance also. And the reason is, it's the heart of the symphony. And it's the breaking of hearts. It's just what, what it would feel like to have those hearts broken. And uh, the fourth movement is arrival over the ocean to America, Ellis Island. And so that was a, a structure that helped me very much. I'm looking at the time here, better move along, okay. Now, in addition, I mean, the way I compose, you've heard a little bit about it, et cetera. And in my mind, for me, composing comes from the heart, solely from the heart. And the discipline is 180 degrees different than in practicing medicine, particularly in diagnosis, where a case comes up, all of the factors are there, all the stimuli, optic stimuli to come up with the right diagnosis. And it's all objective, unemotional. The blinders are on, whether it's my wife or a stranger, the blinders are on, and there's no emotion. Total brain working rationally. Music, the exact opposite. It's all emotion, and there's no brain, at least the way I do it. When I compose, I'll start on something, and I'll just go soaring, knowing in advance the next morning I'm going to trash 90% of it. But if I have my brain be my critic as I'm doing it, it can close doors. It can stop me from doing something that is a little wild, unconventional, whatever. And so it's an exact opposite discipline one to the other. Mr. Lancaster, Michael, Lan and we, be, we become very, very close friends. His role uh, was also as an, I, we call him an editor on the symphony score. I use the word editor because there's nothing to describe what he did. He did many things. 
uh, there was some orchestration involved, arrangement involved. My orchestrations, my arrangements, I had the final call how it would end up. But he would say at times, for example, this area is a little muddy, like an editor of a book. You know, this isn't very clear. You might want a little more definition of the theme, et cetera, and I would work on it. Or he would say, this is sparse. Or very often, we'd have A and C, and we had, I would have to connect them. And he would simply say, you know, my suggestion is anywhere from four to eight minutes, you know, come up with something. I'd usually come up with about eight of them. He would come, we'd review that, pick one, work on it. And that, that's the way it went in general. One final thing about composing, and to me, maybe the biggest thrill. This is the only thing I've ever done in my life that was absolutely pure and honest. Everything we do, no matter personal relationships, business, I won't say there's lying, but there is shading things a little bit. And many white lies are very humane things to do. I didn't have to consider anybody, anything. It's me and what I feel and the music. And out of those thousands, maybe 10,000 notes or more, there isn't one note that I listen to now that I know was not an honest note. Just coming from me because I think it belonged there, not because theory tells me to do it or a conductor's going to like it or the audience is going to like it or not. It's just me. And uh, it's a, I think it's a rare event of, in life that. I, serendipity, I lucked into this type of endeavor. Okay, quickly, all right, so what happened? So I have finally complete the score. Now, one of the ways Michael Lancaster did it was uh, I would play music on the speakerphone to him. I would fax him my scores from the computer, but they wouldn't suffice for any conductor. He would then process them, and then we'd spend time together, and we'd put together what we thought was the final deal. But at times, even during that process, we would play it back, the fully orchestrated, like something like you heard, fully orchestrated score, and as it's playing back, I hear something, a flute line or something, add it. That would be done. Finally, a score. Uh, it's a 59-minute symphony, so it's a huge score. And it's written for a very large orchestra, too, so there are a lot of parts. Finally there, and he then takes from my note, from my computer readout, and handwrites those notes properly with all the proper terms and in increasing volume, decreasing volume. But somebody once asked me about uh, a uh, phrase in music, and I said, you know, I have to level with you. Uh, when somebody even mentions something like andante, I think that's the way you cook Italian spaghetti. <laughs> I, I, know, I know very few of these terms. So there we have the score. It's finished. Now what? Well, the score is nothing. It's a painting on the wall, it's, you look at it, it's there. A score is not, it doesn't exist unless it's played or you hear it on a CD. So I have to have the parts printed for the orchestra. You've seen the orchestra with the stands, frequently two people to one score, very often one person on a score. And so I needed a librarian, a symphony librarian, who would take the handwritten Michael Lancaster score and put it into this fine manuscript form, big pieces of paper, all customized as to when they turned, et cetera. Out of my pocket, that's over $10,000. So you see why it's very difficult for composers. Although a lot of them these days can do it themselves. Through the, it's called finale program, uh, can do it themselves. So from there, from the score, then what? Well, it's gotta be performed. Now, I, I did have a performance uh, when the new conductor of the Hartford Symphony came, he performed the third movement. But in general, uh, it never been, uh, I've never heard it live, and had to have it performed. Well, a big orchestra has to perform it. To do it in the United States is prohibitively expensive. On the other hand, there are superb orchestras in Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, 
where most American composers go, I think, to have it played. I, and again, an area I didn't know about, had to get involved with, had to learn about it. I did have an agent for a while. Uh, I found him ineffective, so I felt I had to take over. And I did, and had a choice between the London Symphony, Czech Philharmonic, and the Bulgarian National Radio Symphony Orchestra, which is the one on the CDs you have. Why them? They, they don't have quite the prestige of the first two, although they're a superb orchestra, and uh, they have a magnificent recording studio. The reason is the first two said, okay, Herwitt, you know, we'll give you from Monday morning till Tuesday at three, and that's it. Now, I, I can barely read music. I've never heard it live, and I knew in advance I'm going to have a lot of suggestions. The Bulgarian orchestra offered six days of the orchestra, plus two days that I could get involved with the final finishing of the CD. Went there, glorious days, although the nights were like I was an intern again, because each day at the end of the day, they'd finish the recording, give me the CD, I'd go home and pull all-nighters, comparing that CD to my CD, and even though that sounded better, I would hear certain changes I wanted made. Michael Lancaster would get up early the next morning, inscribe all those changes, we'd give it to the librarian of the symphony, and by practice time, those changes were in the new score. Then after that was all, by the way, we had 38 microphones, uh, and we could control the sounds all around the symphony, bring up the violin, bring down the violin, etc. So, uh, spend the last two days doing this. Now, when you hear a CD, whether it's mine or anybody else's of symphony, you think it's one continuous performance, perhaps. It's not. With mine, we had like 980 takes, you know, segment from this part, that part. We whittled that down to 85 or 90, in which those takes, we regulated all the sounds from the 38 microphones, because it's all digital. And then, uh, so what you hear is, per, is perhaps 50, 80 seamless snips and sewing together. Uh, that's what the last two days were. Flying home was one of the greatest days of my life. I finally heard, after all these years of work and toil, heard my symphony with real instruments. So I think I've had a good run. Uh, had um, radio performances, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to skip all that, except tell you business people a very quick business anecdote. My CD is for sale on most of the outlets, retail and, and on the internet, and including Amazon, which is probably the most important one. This is a good news, tremendous good news, horrible bad news story from a business point of view. Usually, well, they rate every CD according to sales. So if you're Lady Gaga, you're number one. If you're many composers, you're in the range of a million past. I'm usually in the 300,000, 250, 300,000. And I monitor this once in a while, see any movement. I would say once or twice a month, I will see movement downward. So I'll be 280,000, 150,000, 80,000. By the way, classical music doesn't kick in until, I'm sure you know, until well after Lady Gaga. But, and, there, and as I'm watching it, at some point it says, there's, a, there's an automatic link, go to the best 100 list. And they're all being 99, and, and, and sometimes 50, 40. One time I was number four. Now, how many, I'm not going to ask you to answer, but just think in your mind. How many CDs do you think it takes for me to go from 280,000 to number four on the bestseller list? Don't even try. One or two. <laughs> if anybody wants to join me, you can have a piece of the action, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's the good news, bad news. And so, let us, yes, let us now go to the music presentation. 
And we will start, uh, not quite yet, we will start with the Prague theme. And from a symphonic point of view, uh, certain themes, writing a symphony is a way like a legal argument. Whatever you say at the beginning, it has to, there has to be a thread tying it together. And then at the end, it has to relate. And it's very easy to go off wandering. So composers use themes to simply serve as connective tissue. Sometimes you don't even know you're hearing them. This theme, ba 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 that's probably there 40 times or more in the symphony, but with variations. It may be minor, it may be inverted, et cetera, et cetera. So we will uh, start out with a theme, with the Prague theme. Next, we'll, that's the beginning of movement one. You will hear it throughout, even at the end of the symphony. Now we'll go to movement two, and movement two starts out with the Cossacks on horseback, riding through Milkowitz, Russia, sabers raised, persecuting them and persecuting them. You'll hear a very stormy movement begins, and maybe after 40 seconds or so, It'll stop, and then you'll hear three ascending notes. Bum, bum, bum. These three are saying to them, you must go. And they answer back, no, no, no. You must go, no, no, no. The whole second movement is this conflict. They don't want to leave, and they know they have to sacrifice and make them leave. So let us hear that part now, please. continuation of this argument, and their argument is, look, we, we love you. We don't want to leave you. Plus, this has been our life. All the songs we know, the dances we know, we can't leave them. And they then participate. And all this folk music there is mine. It's not that I took a folk song, but kind of made up what I thought might be appropriate. And so now you'll hear a klezmer group with the orchestra playing some klezmer music as they say, here's one of our favorite dances, etc." But as it goes on, this lively klezmer dance gets frantic. And towards the end, you're going to hear two high clarinet notes. I won't try and mimic them. I'll point out two high notes. And this is the younger generations finally realizing they, they're going to prevail and they're going to go. 
So please. is that terrible feeling of separation. The first part I had written in a way before this whole symphony was uh, created. But it, it was changed according to my feelings, particularly as we get to the second theme. My feelings. I found great inspiration, sadly, from contemplating what they went through. What it's like, what it'd be like if I married, we have three married children and six grandchildren. If the 14 of us went out into our backyard and I said, we're going to separate and we're never going to see each other again. Let's hear some music.
they separate. Isaac, a different time. Isaac leaves, goes to work in New Britain, Connecticut, where that picture is taken, to make enough money to send for all of them. Hannah and the six children cross Europe, start out on an ox cart, onto a train, ship in Amsterdam, cross the ocean, Ellis Island, and arrive in America. Let's hear that. Cross the ocean. They cross the ocean and arrive, Ellis Island, get through, and <clears throat> only communication at that, excuse me for a second. The only communication at that time is by mail. Isaac sent the letter to Anna that the ship is due to arrive, for example, on Monday. <clears throat> and she is to get off, go to Grand Central Station, train to New Britain, and he will meet them at the train. But lo and behold, the ship gets there a day earlier, and he doesn't know it. Now, Isaac has rented an apartment about a mile, mile and a half from the railroad station up on a hill, and what he's doing is tacking up curtains to welcome them the next day. Hannah comes to the railroad station. Obviously, there's nobody there, but luckily, a policeman knows who Isaac Milkowitz is and where he rented an apartment, gives them instructions. Now, this is a scene to contemplate after that journey them walking up the hill, Isaac looking out and seeing them. Now, mind you, he had never seen my mother. She was born about a month or two after he left. And in the meantime, one of the children had died. He looks out and sees this scene. He runs down, hugs, kisses, an unbelievable scene. But the family lore, I knew my grandfather, and. He did have a sense of humor in a way. And the family lore is this touching scene. He says to Hannah after the greetings, Hannah, you're never on time. <laughs> and now, finally, for this part, I'm going to play what you heard at the beginning. Remember I said there's a 45-second piece, see if it feels any different. And I call this the homecoming. It's in, the third, it's in the first movement, but expanded in the final movement. And this homecoming is America. Give me your young, I mean, your poor, et cetera, et cetera. I'm a Lazarus poem. Taking in this family and millions of other families, and I forgot to say earlier, because I think this is very critical. I'm telling you about one family happened to be Jewish. This experience has been going on for centuries with all religious groups, all ethnic groups. And so there's a little idiosyncratic music here, the klezmer. But this is a universal story, and it's still going on today, unfortunately. And so here is our homecoming.
I don't know if you caught it, but just before that started, towards the end of the fourth movement, it was ba ba bump 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 bump. But let's talk about the finale, and then uh, that will finalize everything here. I was going to play the finale on, from the CD of the symphony, uh, but another bit of uh, serendipity, uh, a couple of, uh, I know, a year and a half or so ago, uh, Sunnyside Up Films, it's called, the producer, director team in New York, sought me out to make a documentary movie. Uh, and uh, as part of it, they made what's in the industry a teaser, which is used to raise money and promote their documentary. They followed me to hear a concert performance by the Laredo Philharmonic Orchestra. And from probably 15 hours of footage, they made this two minute teaser. And there's perhaps some interesting parts leading up to the actual finale of the symphony as performed by an orchestra. And again, you will hear, you'll hear the conductor at the end going over something with me just before the finale is played. And he's saying, da, 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 da. And he's, we're trying to determine the tempo to do that. He wants to slow it down. Uh, it is not the way it was written, but I agreed. It would be good to hear it that way. And so let us see uh, the finale of the symphony and the finale of my speech. My name is Albert Hurwitz, but call me Albie. At college, I wanted to major in music, uh, but I flunked the sight reading test, and so I became a doctor instead. <laughs> do a painting, you put it on the wall, done. You write a book, it's done. To do music, you just don't paint it and it's there. You compose it, but it's not there until you get it performed. You can write the greatest piece of music ever created, and if it's not performed or put into a CD, it's not done. It doesn't exist. How does that work? When the clarinet first comes in, bum, 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 it's bum, 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 bum. can't forget how we got here and the sacrifices that were made. If this ever turns into a legacy, that will be the legacy, that we can't forget the past so it's not recreated again. The last movement could actually be called America because it has so many different elements to it that it, it is truly the, the melting pot that is America. Starting here. Da -da da -da -bum -bum -ba -da That, Go for that it. That should do it. Go for right. it. Let's try it tomorrow. Thank you. The people, it's not for me to thank you, it's for them to thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, ordinarily, I have no discipline. And days can go by and there's nothing and then very concentrated. With this, and I liked it because uh, there, were, there was a time kind of set up. I could compose it over four years, 
But with Mr. Lancaster in the background, it's like, you know, you almost get a lesson and you gotta come up with it. And I would say, and my wife will attest to this, at times uh, I could be up there 15 hours a day working and uh, just the time would fly. Uh, so I'd say th there was no strict time frame, but what you hit it, the internal feelings, the drive was there and it propelled me. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, I knew I was going to be asked that. And the, I'm working on a few things, and that's always a problem. Because I'll think, boy, this is red hot, and then all of a sudden I'll hear something in the other thing, the other uh, project. The answer is I have nothing to send to a symphony orchestra. I am working on things. Yes, sir. Uh, I love your music, by the way. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and see, most composers, where I'm a little freaky here also, is most composers, all composers, started studying music at a very early age, were the master of at least one instrument, and continued all kind of education. Uh, sometimes I wonder, what, what, what it would have been like if I had started? Who knows? We're here now. Um, I have great appreciation. Uh, I will level with you, I don't have great appreciation for a lot of atonal, cutting edge music. Uh, I'm sure it's great, it's just not my style. But uh, Beethoven, Mahler, love them. Yes? Thank you for those nice comments. Playing the piano? No. <laughs> I, st I still play like a second year piano student. <laughs> I play by ear a little better than that, but for written music, uh, I, I'm between second and third grade. <laughs> well, I, yes, yes. I can't hear. Yes, as a matter of fact, next Sunday, and then in uh, Michigan, early February. The, the Sunday performance, West Hartford Symphony Orchestra, Regional Orchestra, and in Michigan, it's called the um, Bloomfield Symphony Orchestra, I think it is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I certainly hope that uh, you all appreciated uh, Albie's experience, his gift, his passion, his willingness to get outside the nine dots 
and see what life has in store and has in store for him. We thank you for your gift, Albie.